Greetings in the wonderful name of Christ, the resurrection and the Lamb, the Savior, the great God, the great I Am. Praise God for this time that we are gathered together around the table of truth. And I want to thank you for your commitment and your consistency on your spiritual journey, being able to feast upon the Word of God. We're excited about what God is speaking to us through this team theme that we're ministering from, seizing the God-given moments in our life. God is up to a good work, and He's doing that work in and through your life. Well, we're going to pray, and we're going to go right into our lesson. Father, we honor you for Jesus Christ, and truly He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Thank you, Father, that through Jesus Christ we have access into the holiest through the blood of Jesus, this new and living way that you have provided for us through your veil, that is your flesh. Therefore, we are drawing near to you in a true heart of full assurance of faith, knowing that, God, we have been sprinkled with the precious blood of Jesus and we washed with the pure cleansing of the Holy Spirit, the washing of the word, Father. So we honor you for this time that we have together in your word, Father. We ask that you will speak into our hearts. You will give us understanding, Father. Holy Spirit, let this truth be magnified in our hearts and in our minds for the glory of God. In the wonderful name of Jesus, the Christ, I pray. Amen. Well, we're talking from our theme, uh, season, the God-given moments. And we said that this is a time whereby the believers are praying and they're purposing to walk in step with the master. I believe the Apostle Paul coined it so well in Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 17, where the scripture says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. God has called his people to know his will, that is to know his word, to know his heart, to know his kingdom, to understand how God's operate according to the knowledge of his word. And so Paul used the word to redeem the time or make most of the time. One translation said to buy back the time. We started this journey by listening to John the Baptist when he revealed in John 1 29, he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was not telling them to look at the physical uh, appearance of Jesus but to look at the revelation or listen to the revelation that the Father had revealed to John exactly who Jesus was. Not only did he reveal at baptism that he was the Son of God, but he's revealing to him on the river of the banks of Jordan that Jesus is is the Lamb of God, the fact, the sacrificial Lamb that God was using to redeem mankind back to himself. And in Hebrews 9, 22 say, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Then we look in Hebrew chapter 10, verse 19 through 22, where the scripture says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated created for us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water not only do we have the redemption through the blood of Jesus but we also have access into the presence of God, a, 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 a abiding presence. This presence never leaves us. This is not uh, just the dwelling place of God in heaven, but this is how God has uh, set up his kingdom so that he can dwell with those that belong to him. Well, one of the ongoing challenges we have living in this world that is constant in conflict with the word of God, which is the word of God, is God's people remaining focused and faithful to the things that matter to God. That's why in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, Jesus tells us not to worry, not to be like the Gentiles who worry, but we have a father who knows exactly what we have need of, and he's faithful to minister to take care of our needs. So in Matthew 6, he tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to our life. 
However, once people, the people of God, gain knowledge and genuinely experience God's abiding presence that has been made available through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will continue living out the good things that God has brought for their life through this blood covenant and they will also experience this spiritual priestly position that the blood of Jesus have brought us into as children of the Most High God. And I believe the, he, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 9, verse 11 through 14, take your Bibles and turn there because I believe the writer of, Hebrew, of, the writer of Hebrews gives us insight to what these, the, these good things, remember I said the blood of Jesus not only takes care of the sin issue of our life, but it gives us access, fellowship, intimacy, I call it sweet communion, in the throne room of God, in the holiest place, it's not like we just go in there on Sunday. See, religion looked to do that. But man, the presence of God is ever with us. Yes, yes, we walk in the light of his countenance. The Bible says that he's a present help in the time of trouble. You know what? He's already there even before the trouble came. That's why we trust in him. But there are also these other blessings that come with this blood covenant relationship we have with the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Hebrews chapter 9, listen to these scriptures here in verse 11 through 14. He said, but Christ came as high priest of good things to come. Notice, Christ came as a high priest. We notice according to Hebrews 10 that he is the high priest over what? Over the house of God, over the family of God. But the Bible says he came as a high priest of good things to come. There are a lot of good things in this blood covenant. And as I said, if Christians don't know their rights and benefits that come with being a blood-washed, born-again believer, they're going to miss out on all the blessings in the benefits that come with being in covenant relationship with God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He's not talking about that old tabernacle that was made with hands. He's talking about a spiritual tabernacle. Now, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. It is a, it is a done deal. Hallelujah. Our salvation is secured because of what Jesus did on Calvary, what Jesus did by overcoming the grave, death, and hell. We are secure in Christ Jesus. And then verse 13 says, for if the blood of bulls and goats in the ashes of a heifer, uh, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Here again, he's making a contrast between that old temple and this new temple that we have through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. Notice, the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works. Now, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, the Bible says that, the, uh, that let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure words. So here in Hebrews 10, he talks about an evil conscience. What's an evil conscience? Guilt, doubt, and unbelief. The blood of Jesus have set us free from walking in that kind of fear before God. We walk by faith in fellowship with God through the blood of the Lord Jesus. But now he uses another word here in Hebrews chapter 9. He say, cleanse your conscience from dead works. Somebody say, well, what are the dead works? The dead works are things that does not glorify God. The dead works are things that does not allow us to fully surrender ourselves to the service of God. So the Bible say that there is this blood covenant that the blood of Christ cleanses our conscience from dead works. Now, notice he cleanses us from dead works. We don't have to do it in the flesh. We don't have to do it in fear. We don't have to do it for self uh, 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 gratification and, and focusing on ourselves. Those are dead works. 
when we're doing things for God and we're not doing it for the glory of God, they are dead works. Regardless how people run to the works, regardless how people talk about the works, the Bible says they are dead works. When we have the blood of Jesus, we are free from dead works. Now, when we're free from dead works, what happens? Now we're able to serve the living God. And see, what we don't realize that with this blood covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you and I are now in a position to serve the living God. Now, this is where we become a priestly royal family to God. This is where we are positioned in a priestly position. And so in Revelations chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, listen to this. The scripture says, when Jesus, when John got that revelation concerning Jesus and he began to speak concerning the condition of those seven churches, and all of a sudden in Revelations 1, 5 and 6, listen to what John said. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is the first one that ever rose from the dead and never died again. Other people that came back from the dead, they eventually died. But Jesus is the first one who rose from the dead never to die again. He has an eternal priesthood. And not only is he the first one from the dead, in the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's his throne. He is the ruler. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Notice, we are now through the blood of Jesus positioned as priests in God's kingdom. We're not the high priest. Jesus is the only high priest over the house of God. And when we serve God, we serve God within the context of the body of Christ. Why? Because he's the high priest over the body of Christ. So when people go out doing their own thing, when people go out talking about the Lord called me and they're not being released by the church, by the saints, they don't have the land on, hand, land on of hands by the church. That's a renegade. They're out there on their own. But God works through the body of Christ. And Jesus is the great high priest over the body of Christ. So therefore, when we are operating in our priestly position, uh, hallelujah, now I'm not talking about your little license and your little ordination that you got off the internet or somebody came, a friend or a family member gave. No, no, I'm talking about an anointing. I'm talking about when things are done in decency and order. And I'm talking about when that order of the church, when that, that, that agreement of the church is being released on a person's life to go out to do a work from God, they are carrying out a priestly assignment. And in that priestly position, the Bible say that we will serve God in a manner that brings glory to him. That's what makes the difference. That our service bring glory to God. Now listen to this in 1 Peter 2 and 9. The Bible says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We're a royal priesthood. Why? Because of the king. Because Jesus, he is the great high priest and a holy nation. Notice, the priest position and holiness go hand in hand. The priests had to be able to present themselves so they could stand before God based on that old system, based on that blood system that was a shadow of what was to come. God honored that system for, for a time until the blood of Christ came. And that blood not only worked for us, but it worked for those Old Testament people of faith. And it says that God's special possession, notice, we belong to God. We're God's property that you may declare the praises of him who call you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And then in 1 Peter 2 and 5, listen to this. You also like living stones. Jesus is the living stone. We are like him. We are being transformed to look more like Christ. We are going from glory to glory. That means we are beginning to reflect the character and the attributes of Christ in our lifestyle. 
So you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. Got to get this to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So in our priestly position, it's not about our robes and our garments. It's not like in Leviticus chapter 16, God instructed Aaron to make sure that he put on those holy garments. That's under that old order. And so when we see that spirit coming into church with their different kinds of garments to imply who they are, how great they are, I'll tell you the kind of garments that we should be putting on. We should be taking a towel and putting it around our waist. We should be taking a basin of water so we can go and wash the feet of others. That's the kind of garment that Jesus wants us to reflect in the kingdom of God, not a garment so people can look at us and think that we are great and that we are exalted and that we are in a position now where religious people, now these are religious people, religious people bow down and worship garments. Yes. But those who are led by the Spirit of God, they don't put no value in a garment. They value people because they are people. They are human beings. They are God's creation. And so we don't disrespect other people because they don't have position in certain garments and certain title. We have a love for the brotherhood. We have a love for the body of Christ. I just want to be able to bring emphasis to that because we go under that old covenant and we pick out certain things that were practiced under that old priestly order and we only pick out the things. Now listen, we only pick out the things that make us sound great or look great or look important. Well, why don't you go get the bulls? Why don't you go get the calves? Why don't you go get the lambs and bring them also in your church? And what you're going to have? A bunch of mess. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're going to have a bunch of mess. But no, we go pick and choose the things that we want from that old order. I want to let you know that God has canceled out that old order. That's not the order that we follow now. The order that we follow is that we come under the priestly anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not what we look like on the outside that empowers us. It's the anointing. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the love of God that is to be reflected out our lives. It is the humility of Jesus that is to be able to be reflected out and through our lives for the glory of God. In verse 15 of, of Hebrews chapter 9, this is good news for those Old Testament saints. It says this, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of of eternal inheritance. Don't you know those Old Testament saints are blessed because of the blood of Jesus? Don't you know they're able to move and tap right into that fact? They look forward to that promise. And when that promise came, oh, they were able to tap into the benefits and blessings also that come through the blood covenant. Well, I want us to, uh, to, to consider this today. What constitutes priestly or spiritual sacrifices? The scripture says again in first two, first Peter two and five, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priest. And notice it's a spiritual temple. It is a spiritual things now. It has nothing to do with the garments that we have on. It has nothing to do with our titles. It has nothing to do with the fact that people are supposed to come through us. No, you don't have to come through a priest, uh, a priest to get to this. Uh, uh, to, to God. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. You don't go through a priest. You don't go through someone else. If you have the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the high priest over the house of God. You have access into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The Bible call it a new and living way that's been consecrated for us by the veil, by the flesh. Oh, glory to God. Boy, when we get a revelation of this redemptive work that has been done by the Lord Jesus Christ, we will shout, we will honor God, and we will produce spiritual sacrifices. That's what the priests did under the Old Testament. They operated in a manner to present spiritual offer, spiritual sacrifice. But notice this. The Bible says you don't just offer up spiritual sacrifices. They got to be acceptable to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything people offer up is not acceptable to God. 
Everything people are doing is not acceptable to God. Hallelujah. We've got to be able to line ourselves up with the word of God and make sure we are honoring the word of God and how we are offering up spiritual or what I call priestly sacrifice. Well, I believe there's some lessons we can gain in what it means or uh, 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 what constitutes a priestly uh, 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 the offering up of spiritual sacrifice. That's one of the best blessings we have through the redemptive work of Jesus, through the shed blood of Jesus. We're able to serve God in a manner that is acceptable through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe the first thing is this. We have to render all service to God. Yes, if we're going to operate in the position of a priestly role, which God has brought us in through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to have to render all service to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 and verse 33, Paul was dealing with the issue concerning uh, food that had been offered up to idol that was causing a little disunity among those Christians. And Paul basically was telling them, basically I'm paraphrasing, not to be selfish, but consider others. And if there are certain things that's going to be a stumbling block to your brother or sister, make sure you restrict your liberty so you can have the unity. In other words, Paul placed unity above liberty. And in the body of Christ, people call themselves being free to do whatever they want to do. In the name of God has called me to liberty, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And then you see what? You see disunity in all that they're doing. Again, God, when you know the word, you can put the word to light. You can shine light on anything with the word of God and be able to see clearly what is of God and what is not of God. And when people are doing things out of the flesh and call it God and call it the Holy Ghost, we that are spiritual mature and know how to discern between good and evil and know how to discern where the word is being uh, magnified or not magnified in this situation, we know better. It's the unlearned. It's those who are religiously blind by religion. And it's those who have a false sense of humility. They can't discern that. But hopefully you'll grow up in the things of God and you can use the scriptures as a magnifying glass to know what is of God and what is not of God. So listen how Paul concluded with these particular believers in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he said, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Paul said, whatever you do, make sure you are rendering it as unto the Lord, that is for the glory of God. That's what the priest did. When the priest went in and was able to carry out their role, they did it for the glory of God. They did it so they could minister to the needs of God's people. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 33, the Bible says, and it says, just as I try to please everyone in everything, I do not seek in my own advantage, but that many that they may be saved. Notice Paul said, my motivation is to reach people for the kingdom of God, to bring them into the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul said, I brought certain restrictions on myself, even though I had the liberty but with my liberty, I didn't use it for an opportunity of the flesh, but I would put certain restrictions on myself in order that I may have impact in such a way that people can be born again so that people can be saved. And sometimes when you have a heart for souls, you have to be able to expose all of this foolishness, this carnality, this pride that's within the body of Christ. You got to expose it because this stuff is keeping people from coming into the family of God. People coming into a place where the Holy Spirit can bring the conviction for sin. Don't you know the Holy Spirit came to convict us of sin? So when we gather together and the word is rightly divided and the word is coming forth and people are, are having an issue with sin in their life, it's so that the light of truth can shine. God is not condemning them, but God is convicting them so they can look unto Jesus and be saved. The second thing I believe we have to do if we're going to be able to operate in the position of priest and offer up spiritual sacrifice is that we got to represent others before God. The highest blessing of the priesthood is that they were permitted to appear before God as the representative of others before God. 
having followed the order God gave to Moses for his brother Aaron and for his offspring, as well as for the tribes of the Levite to stand in the presence of God. In, in Leviticus 16 and 30, the scripture says, this is what God said to Aaron relative to the priesthood. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all of your sins before the Lord. So what did the priest do under the old order? They represented the people before God. Yes, they went and, 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 and they stood in the behalf of the people before God. And then for the Levites, in Deuteronomy 10 and 8, Moses said, At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister and pronounce blessings in his name as they still do today. And so we see then that under that Old Testament order, the priests, they brought the blood unto the holy place before God, in God's presence. They were standing in the presence of God. There was a cloud that would be over them which represented the presence of God. There was the Ark of the Covenant which represented the presence of God. So what? They carried out their work in the presence of God. And see, that's why we have a challenge with believers serving in God's kingdom because they don't see the value of of the, they don't recognize the value of the blood of Jesus. Jesus' blood is the blood that has given us access in the presence of God. So when we are serving, we are serving in the presence of God. Therefore, God is listening to our attitudes. He's listening to our words. He sees our heart. Whether we are really doing this as unto the Lord and for the glory of God. That's why in Colossians 3, 17, the scripture says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Let me tell you something. When you are able to serve in God's house, you should say that's a blessing because you are serving in the presence of the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in the New Testament, when we are representing others before God, we are not representing them as the old order of the priesthood, but we are in a different priestly kingdom. And now we represent others through the prayer and specifically the prayer of intercession on behalf of others. When God permitted those priests to approach him through the blood, it was so that he might bless them in order that they might become a blessing. You notice when the priests went into that holiest place, it was first for themselves. So they had to bring what? They had to bring a sacrificial lamb for themselves. Then they went and got the goat of the lamb and they brought the lamb on the behalf of the people. In other words, they were blessed by God to stand in that place, to serve God in his presence. And they recognized that not only are we called to be blessed by God, but we are called to be a blessing unto the people of God. Intercession finds its power through the prayer of faith. This is not a, you know, a wishing prayer, a hoping prayer, but this is an intense praying in the behalf of others. James, he brings it out in James chapter five. Listen to verse number 15. The Bible say in the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. What kind of prayer? The prayer of faith. The prayer that believes the promises of God and begin to pray those promises on the behalf of others. You are representing others as a priest before God. You, 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 you understand your priestly position. It's not about your robe. It's not about your garments. It's about the anointing. It's about being in the presence of God. It's about having a heart, a love for others, and a desire to see the good works of God manifested in their lives and through their lives for the glory of God. I want you to know how this intercession works. First of all, time with God to secure his promise. That's how intercession works. You have to get in the presence of God. 
And you have to get in his word and you have to identify those promises that pertain to the situation in which you are praying in the behalf of others. In other words, you are praying the word of God. You are praying the will of God. And the Bible teaches us in 1 John that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we have made of him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And so when it comes to intercession, now listen, listen, if we're going to operate in our priestly position, we talk about I'm a royal priesthood and we talk about, you know, we brag about ourselves. But a royal priesthood means that you are offering up spiritual sacrifices. You are serving in God's presence. Hallelujah. The next thing you have to do, you have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit in its application. This is where you ask the Holy Spirit to help you. You have this promise. Now you pray, Holy Spirit, help me so that this promise can be applied with this situation on the behalf of this person for the glory of God. Remember, all of it is for the glory of God. And then after that, you take hold of the burden and you carry it in prayer. Paul said in Galatians 4, 19, that I travail in prayer again until Christ be formed in you. What's that? Transformation. So he carried on that burden of prayer. And so you take hold of that burden. Well, you're not carrying it in your flesh. You are carrying it into the throne room in the presence of God. And you are representing those individuals, that person, in, and, and you're standing in their stead. You are, you, you, you are making up the gap. You are, you are standing in the hedge. That's what intercession is. And so you are taking on the burden. And you lay hold of the promise as if it was your own. You are praying for them just as though you were praying for a breakthrough for your own life. You are willing to be what? You are willing to persevere. You are willing to pray and lay out before God. You are willing to cry out before God. And instead of worrying, instead of trying to fix it for them, perhaps God is saying, this is the time you're going to have to operate as a spiritual temple. This is the time you're going to have to take the blood covenant and the promises that I've given, and you're going to have to stand in their stead. You're going to have to intercede for them. And then you abide in God's presence until there is a sense of release of answer prayer. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. This kind of intercession, you just know in your spirit when it's time to come out of prayer. You know in your spirit through that prayer that there's a release, there's a breakthrough, there's, a, there, there's an answer to that prayer. And you are being what? Very sensitive to the spirit of God. So the priests, they represented others before God, they pray the prayer of intercession. How do we operate in our priestly position? By offering up spiritual sacrifice. We are refreshed in God's presence. Not only did the priest bring the blood before the mercy seat in God's presence, but they also brought the incense in order to fill the place with a fragrance as an offering to the Lord. In Leviticus 16, verse 12 and 13, listen to what the scripture says. Talking about that Old Testament priestly order. Now, we're not patterned after that, but we can look back and see some of the things in which the priest did. Now, we're doing it not in a material temple, not in a temple made by hands, but we're doing it as the temple of God, a spiritual house, and we're offering up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable through God, through the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't sprinkle blood of animals, but we plead the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. So Leviticus 16 and 12 says this. And he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and, and, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small and he shall bring it inside the veil. What's inside the veil? The holiest place. And then in verse 13, in Leviticus 16, verse 13, say, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. Spiritually speaking, our prayers become spiritual incense in which he desires to surround with his habitation. In Psalms 22 and 3, listen what the scripture says. But you are holy 
enthroned in the praises of Israel. Here is where we worship God with prayers of adoration and thanksgiving in the presence of God. And there is a refreshing that you and I will experience in God's presence. There's a strength. There's a there's a an encouragement that you and I will experience in the presence of the Most High. These are spiritual offerings as unto the Lord. The writer said in Hebrews 13, 15, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Saints, I'm telling you, there's a place in the presence of God where all you give him is adoration and thanksgiving. You adore him. You, you, you recognize the majesty of God, how majestic he is, how glorious he is. You are enjoying that moment. And I often tell people when you limit this to just singing, you are missing out on that awesome experience that comes when the word of God that's in your heart begin to flow out of your mouth in worship. And Paul said in, the first, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, where he said, do not be drunk with wine, words in excess, but be filled with the spirit, speaking to yourselves with, haunt, with hymns and songs and spiritual songs, making melody, unto, uh, making melody unto the Lord. Oh, that's awesome. When the church is, is, is releasing a fragrance all over the building of people speaking forth the praises of God. When there's a melody flowing and people are worshiping God and, and thanking God for his faithfulness and thanking God for his presence and thanking God for the glory and the power of his kingdom and thanking God for the miracles and signs and wonders and thanking God for his faithfulness, giving thanks unto the Lord. The Bible says it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Hallelujah. And so they, there's that place where, where we are refreshed in the presence of God. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus allows us to serve God in an acceptable manner. This means we carry out our priestly spiritual sacrifices. And we do that when we render all service to the glory of God. When we represent others before God, that's that intercession. And when we are refreshed in God's presence. I want to encourage you today from this day forward, your serving God should take on new meaning. Your serving God should be like, God, I am serving in your presence is here. Listen, listen, the veil has been ripped from top to bottom. We don't have to come and talk about I'm going through this court and, you know, people try to get deep spiritually. I'm in the outer court, but I'm going through this court and I'm a man. When I wake up, I'm in the inner court. Hallelujah. When I'm driving down the road, I'm in the inner court. I'm in the high, I get this, I'm in the holiest place because Jesus' dwelling place is among us now. Hallelujah. His presence don't show up because you're at church and, and all of a sudden you say the prayer. No, his presence is with us. Do we recognize that? Do we have revelation of the word? Do we know that according to Hebrews, the Bible tells us that now we are able through boldness, knowledge to enter into the holiest by the blood, and blood of Jesus, a new and living way that has been consecrated by his flesh. It is a new and living way. He wanted, to, he wanted the Jews when he came to know there's a new and living way. You don't have to wait to get to the sin of God. You don't have to wait for the priest. Listen, listen. You don't have to go in a, in, in a place and get in a booth and sit on and let the priest sit on the other side so you can confess your sins to him. He cannot forgive your sins. The only person who can forgive sins is the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, God has given us direct access to Jesus, but we can only get there through the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Through the blood of Jesus. And while you are serving, remember, you're in the presence of God. So make sure you're serving with the right heart. Make sure that what you're doing, you're doing it with joy. You're doing it with, 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 with cheerfulness of heart. You're rejoicing 
instead of complaining about others, instead of talking about other people are not doing nothing. Listen, the blessings come because you're serving in the presence of God. And people have a tendency to be jealous of people and to be, try to judge people because they see certain great things happening in their life. Perhaps they're serving in the presence of God. Perhaps they recognize that what I'm doing to serving in my local church, I am doing it for the glory of God. God say, do it all for his glory. That means whatever you're doing in your home, do it for the glory of God. Whatever you're doing on your job, do it for the glory of God. Whatever you're doing in your business, do it for the glory of God. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, do it as you recognize that God's presence is here. Because of the blood of Jesus, I am now dwelling, I am living, I am abiding in the presence of God. And you got to have faith in that because the Bible say you got to draw near with a pure heart, a sincere heart, and in the full assurance of faith. Hallelujah. He's our great high priest. He's the mediator of this covenant. He's the one that it stands between us and God and what he does. He, he, he prays, he intercedes in our behalf. That's his ministry now. He ever lived to make intercession on the behalf of the saints. What he's doing in the presence of God, interceding for us because why? Because we've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop right here. And I have a few faith action questions just to encourage us. I believe, oh, glory to God. You, you all, you're going to serve God with a fresh revelation now from this day forward. You're not just doing church work, you're not looking at how little you can do. You're not you know, making God's kingdom the last priority in your life. There are blessings that God want to bring in your life. And I believe a lot of those blessings and sometimes a lot of those prayers have not manifested because people are not willing to serve God in an acceptable manner through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is offering up spiritual sacrifice. That's what priests do. If we say we are priests of God, we are the royal priesthood. Are you serving others? Are you representing others before God? That's what it means to be a priest of God. You stand in the presence of God. Well, the faith question I have, action question, how does realizing God's abiding presence with you through the blood of Jesus impact you serving as unto the Lord? I believe it's going to have a greater impact on your life I mean, I think you're going to be mindful of the fact that based on the scriptures, the presence of God is always with me. I dwell in his presence. And when I begin to praise him, man, he just manifests greater dimensions of that presence because he dwells in our praise where there's adoration and thanksgiving going on. Hallelujah. He, that becomes a habitation for the Lord. The glory of God is intensified at that moment. Because what? We're speaking the language of the kingdom. We're speaking the language of the spirit of God that brings glory to God from a sincere heart of faith. And the next question, whose burden or sin are you willing to carry in prayer? Boy, I believe we got to get back to interceding for others. I mean, praying, writing down name, having prayer lists, going before God, laying hands on that list, prophesying over their lives, speaking the promises of God over them. God in our heart and mouth from speaking contrary to what we are believing God. Remember, we are interceding for them. We are taking up on that burden, not so we can be stressed out, not so we can't sleep or we worrying. We're carrying that thing to God in prayer. And we are believing that promise for them just as if though we are believing it for ourselves. Hallelujah. And what does a habitation for God's presence look like in your prayer life? What does that look like in your prayer life, your worship life? Is there adoration? Do you just love being in his presence and worshiping him and letting the fruit of your lips offer up the sacrifice of praise continually? Are you being refreshed in his presence? Are you thinking, man, I wish they heard up. I'm ready to go. I want to go do some carnal, do some fleshly. And here your spirit, man, is being ministered to in worship. Remember, You've been built up a spiritual house that you may offer up spiritual sacrifice. This, this blood covenant we are in is not a physical temple made with the hands of men. It is a spiritual temple that has been established through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Well, I want to thank you for uh, your commitment to coming to the table of truth on a consistent ba basis and being able to know that God has not only started a work in you, but he's completing that work and he's causing you to experience what we call transformational living. That is a life witness that's growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to look more like Christ in word and deed in every area of your life. That's transformational living and that's the kingdom of God. We are being transformed. Hallelujah. I want to thank all of you for your prayers and your acts of grace on my wife and I 30th wedding anniversary. Uh, we are humbled and grateful because of your love for God and your love for the body of Christ. So we just want to say thank you uh, for the glory of God. Uh, Lady Curly is continuing to minister what we call noonday edition of Wednesday in the Word from 12 to about 1.15 p.m. And we want to encourage you, those who are not working, you are what you call retired. Now, in the kingdom of God, you never retire in God's kingdom, uh, but you may not be working a job or you're working a job. Uh, you're right around the military base in this particular area here on the southeast side of Columbia. Uh, matter of fact, one of the gates from the military base come right out on Leesburg Road, and right over here to Kaufman Trotter. You can come and be able to be refreshed in the word of God. Uh, uh, well, we encourage you to come throughout this month. She's going to be ministering uh, that which God has uh, laid upon her heart. And this is third Sunday. So this is our God given opportunity for us to sow beyond ties and give into missions. Mission here, we call it warfare. And therefore, we believe that not only through our prayers and spiritual intercession, uh, but also through our uh, ministry of giving and supplying to the needs of others. And not only right here in our local church, but beyond our local church and our and our Jerusalem, that is in the communities all around us, in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. That seed goes out and it goes out in a manner that glorifies God and minister to the needs of others. So I want to thank you for being mission minded, having a heart for mission, having a heart to look for opportunities to pray and believe God that you can be a part of what God is doing and touching the lives of others. And listen, it's okay to join in with someone else that's doing a work when you know that it is a work for the glory of God and you know that's the spirit of God behind that to join in. Your name don't have to be called. Your church name don't have to be called. You don't have to call the news station to come and put you on TV and what you doing and all this. Remember this, do all for the glory of God. Make sure that your heart is right to make sure that you're doing this for the glory of God. Well, God bless you and thank you for joining me around the table of truth and God's willing, we are looking to continue as we continue to minister concerning season, the God-given moments, uh, praying and purposing to walk in step with the master. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Have a great day.